there we go. All right. Awesome. Well, we're excited to talk about this very relevant topic in this community, which is digital nomading or traveling um, slowly in this lifestyle. And this is super relevant, I think, for both of us um, in the recent months, having a lot of experiences that relate to what we're going to share about directly. So first, we're just going to get started um, by introducing what we're sharing about, which is a bit about slow travel versus quick travel. This lifestyle of nomading can be lived in so many ways and using so many different types of accommodation options as well. Um, so we're gonna dive deep into co-living and the other options and ways that you can go about living in different places. And then very, very important as we all know here is community and how to have that in this lifestyle. Nomad Haven is one excellent example and what's brought us all together here today. And just as we're living nomadically all over the globe, it's just such an important piece to feel grounded in when we are often changing many locations. So we're going to dive into all these different areas and I'm going to let Anya introduce herself. Yes. Hi. Um, so I would consider myself a slow traveling nomad um, for about well, eight years, a bit more now. Um, and I wasn't really even aware of the term or what I did was slow traveling nomading <laughs> until I kind of had to put it into, um, yeah, into a definition. And uh, I'm currently located between uh, Italy and Berlin. So I have, um, I have a base uh, here and also in Berlin, um, but I'm now not at home traveling around because I'm organizing co-living and co-working retreats in rural areas of Italy. And we'll I'll tell you more about it later. Um, but yeah, the whole lifestyle um, that I've been living has turned into uh, something that I now do for a living um, for other remote workers and nomads um, after spending uh, years in, in the corporate world in project management and consulting. Um, and one of the things that really drive me currently is to um, make an impact uh, social and ecologically and to work for something that is more in line with my values and has a more meaning and purpose uh, to me than um, the previous uh, projects that I've been involved with. Um, so I'm in this kind of transformation phase still and uh, being part of Nomad Haven has really um, been a great support and, and encouragement uh, to be uh, with other entrepreneurs, to be connected digitally, like also how I met Kristen and we um, found that we have this great alignment uh, regarding this topic, we started to organize talks and so it's, yeah, it's just um, really has become a really important um, part of my journey as an entrepreneur. And yes, it, it's been so nice to connect and, and thank you Flaminia for that, for how we got connected through this community because it's been beautiful to see how our passions for this lifestyle are so aligned. Um, and we have so many shared philosophies, which is why it's great to present this together today. So I started my journey living abroad in Argentina and Buenos Aires. I moved abroad um, after doing a solo backpacking trip that was life-changing. I had worked in tech for seven years in San Francisco, felt super burnt out in my career, uninspired, um, just really stuck. I was really, now that I look back, I see how unhappy I was, but I don't even think I was aware of how unhappy I was. I just knew something had to change and travel just opened up this whole new world for me. And I went to Central America and I lived with a family and I learned Spanish and I saw how they lived and how family was a priority and how just enjoying their day-to-day -day life. It wasn't like the hustle grind. And I love to see just the prioritization of like loved ones and of just being and enjoying life. And so I got super inspired and I read a book while I was on that trip by Jen Sincero, You Are a Badass, for those who know it. And it was like, I want to be a coach. I want to help people change their lives. But that's all I knew. Like, I was literally just knew I wanted to make that happen someday, somehow. I didn't know when. I was like, maybe five to 10 year plan. Uh, and then I ended up moving back to the US, itching to get back and 
going on this intense job search to find a job to get me to a Latin American country. And that ended up being in Argentina, the job. And um, I had never been to Buenos Aires. I actually like barely had looked it up on a map, which is kind of embarrassing. But I was, <laughs> I when I got the offer, I was like, wow, this could not be further away. Um, but I went for it and it was like completely life-changing and living there turned into this lifestyle for me uh, because I was again in a role there that the one catch to this was very misaligned with my values. It was extremely challenging. I cried my first month every night there with overwhelmed by my work and settling into a new country. And it just, it was an extreme growth period yet again. And I decided to leave that job because I knew it wasn't serving me. And I had gotten very connected with my intuition through this whole journey. So I knew to honor it, I had to leave the job and decided I wanted to go remote and I wanted to build a remote lifestyle because I just wanted to see more of South America and experience it. So that turned into a slow travel lifestyle and going remote. And during that time, I decided it's time to become a career coach. So people do not face these experiences and to help people see that you can find fulfilling work and um, you can find work that aligns with how you want to live your life. So that's all evolved into what I'm doing now, which is coaching others on building this lifestyle and a career that's aligned for them and their values. Um, and it's also created this slow travel lifestyle that we're going to talk more about today. Um, so we, we all may have different responses to this, but do you consider yourself a digital nomad? We have a barcode here. So if you can um, scan it and give us a vote, we want to hear. Or we, or we do it verbally since we are, we're not a lot of people. We can yeah. also just do it verbally if you want to give your, um, your, how do you consider yourself? How would you describe your lifestyle or your travel lifestyle let's say that's a yes I see <laughs> yes. um I feel like no <laughs> um I travel a lot but I have a home base so I do not consider myself a digital nomad okay yeah awesome and that's why this community we we all have I think nomadic ties mm -hmm. but we can live this in many different ways right mm -hmm. um so I started to talk about slow travel. We share this passion, as Anya was saying. And uh, after going remote and starting to move around, uh, it kind of was, my movement kind of was motivated by the pandemic. I had to leave Argentina in the pandemic. And so that actually is what started my slow travel lifestyle. Otherwise, my plan was to use Argentina as a home base and to travel and come back and forth. Pandemic, I think, made changes for us all. So it actually is what inspired me to start slow traveling. And it was just that I found um, this approach much more aligned for me in terms of really immersing and getting to know each place and to really connect and build community. Um, as someone who is just, I'm a little more introverted and I, um, I feel like it takes me time to ground and I've shared with this community about how I'm a deep feeler. Uh, I think slow travel aligns with that because it also really just allows you to take your time so you feel settled and grounded in each place. Uh, but a beauty is too, is that it's connection to the local community. It's the ability to give back. It's um, the ability to really learn about the local community. And I just am a strong believer that that just doesn't happen quickly after picking up my pace in Europe. I've I've reconfirmed that, or I guess have more evidence behind it. Um, but I just think it takes time and intentionality. So it's why I'm a huge advocate and fan. And this is how I like to live as of now um, is slow traveling. Yeah, same here. I can I can completely agree. And uh, just from I don't know, laying out my my travel plans or how I move, I felt it's always good to kind of have a kind of framework um, that leaves a lot of room and then you can always put more in if you feel like you have the capacity and the energy but if you if you you know if you're stressed and you 
you change location every week. It's just you have to keep up. You cannot, you don't have a different um, choice. So um, definitely works for me. Um, and I do it that I also have a home base. So I always kind of, you know, travel and then return uh, home, you know, wash my, wash my clothes, <laughs> repack, <laughs> and <laughs> I'm off again. So it's, um, yeah, I'm not completely living out of my backpack, but uh, it's, it's a bit different. But I would still say I'm, I'm more traveling than home at the moment. Um, and uh, yeah, the slow traveling aligns really well with um, something I've recently recently tapped into more which is a uh, slow living and it's uh, very different the slow living um, from what I knew or what I would say we generally know from like our corporate uh, world our corporate jobs where it's always you know trying to push more into it and um, when I moved to Italy two years ago I think part of it was because I really, you know, I enjoyed the lifestyle, you know, sitting at lunch, having a glass of white wine. It's like, it's just really kind of, um, you, you see everyone here living, like enjoying life more than um, from, from other parts of the world where I've lived. Um, however, I still, had, uh, I still had my other job and um, it was kind of uh, intense. Uh, I also changed jobs when I arrived here. So I had a kind of similar journey like you, Kristen. So I, I moved abroad and then um, I, I kind of saw around me um, <laughs> this, uh, this way of, um, uh, yeah, way of living differently, but I couldn't, I didn't really feel it like it, I couldn't do it yet. Um, and uh, just lately when I was uh, actually in, in Tuscany, uh, where I took this picture, I really had this, um, all of this pressure was, was gone. And I, um, I, after I launched my project, I also did a lot of work, but nowadays it's like, I really got into this slow living, really feeling it and, um, you know, taking, uh, taking the time, not putting an alarm, um, setting, um, not setting too many, um too many maybe milestones um and just you know flowing a bit more with my energy and um what i can do and uh, now this may really makes a difference so what i'm trying to say is that it it comes more from within for me than to find it in the in the outside world um that we live in and i am aware that it's quite a privileged or luxury situation that i'm in right now is to be able to allow myself this um but it is really the kind of like a mind mind uh, set shift that was that was going on, um, to really understand what slow living actually actually means to me. So um, yeah, just some effects that I was looking up on uh, what constant stress can do to ourselves because one of the reasons that I was um, not really feeling my my career. Uh, last year anymore was that I had a constant kind of feeling of stress, you know, mm, pressure on my chest. I developed like a chronic skin, so skin disease. So like the whole lifestyle I felt wasn't serving me and was making making me even sick. And um, I think, uh, or I know that uh, chronic or constant stress, you don't, it doesn't mean that you directly burn out, but you can like it's a it's a slow and and subtle process um and here you can see a lot of effects that this can have on like physically on your on your body you can um it can be measured but also um like you know mental issues um just fatigue insomnia and even memory loss so it can affect our brain if we are under under constant stress so it's just my attempt to say um maybe we should uh sometimes rethink the way that we put pressure on ourselves or that uh in certain jobs or situations um the pressure is is loaded onto the individual yeah I completely agree. And I um, think slow living has been a life changer, but it's hard to always, especially, I think we can all relate as entrepreneurs 
to always honor it. But I had a moment this past weekend after all these recent quicker wedding travels I've been doing where I just like was like, nope, none of the work I'm going to do. Well, I did work some, I'm not going to lie, but I, I was like, nope, I'm embracing like slowness this weekend. And I didn't set an alarm clock. I made zero plans and it was so refreshing. And it brought me back to why I created this life, which is to live more slowly and more simply and more fulfilled. And I think um, as entrepreneurs, it's, yes, we want to keep growing. It isn't, we do have businesses now and this is our, our well being. but I think it's still so important to honor a core value. If that's, for example, slow living for you or to honor what feels true to us, um, even with all the messages we may hear on how to do it, you know? Um, and so slow living has been one of those for me also. And it's part of why I left corporate, part of why I left the US. Um, and so I have to always like reconnect with that when I feel I get misaligned. Um, and just to share as you're traveling and working um, or wherever we are, work-life integration is so important so that we don't see those effects of stress similar to you, uh, what you were sharing about your effects on your body. When I lived in San Francisco, I had like stomach ulcer like condition that would flare up. Um, and I had no idea what it was until I grew and understood how our bodies are always giving us information, which it was literally, I was stressed and burnt out and it channeled through my, you know, stomach problems. Um, mm. and it's never happened since. So it's just that our body is always telling us things. And it's tuning into that and making sure we're listening to it and honoring it and managing our stress through exercise and movement or setting strong boundaries around our work and for self-care and um, for, mind for mindfulness practices and for our time for ourselves um, and honoring a healthy diet and slowing down, right? So it's, um, I think the balance, and I think this all really comes to the boundaries piece is really, I was just talking with someone about this, about creating strong boundaries with ourselves about how we can honor our business, but also our well being. Um, because it really falls all onto us when we're on this journey, right? Thankfully, we have this community for support. Uh, but we really dictate it for ourselves. So yeah. I think just the balance is the key, right? Yeah, completely agree. I feel like this is something we can all potentially relate a lot on. So maybe we open this up as another discussion as to how others here feel about kind of whether it's finding balance in general or finding balance when you're working and moving around. I can go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like this has definitely been very present in my life in these last two weeks um, where I did the count. And in the last month, I've moved probably eight to nine times, which sounds absolutely wow. absurd. <laughs> I know. And it's funny because like what I realized that as like, it just all caught up to me at one moment where it was like, I was okay. Like throughout each of those moves, it was like, cool. I have my rituals. I'm meditating. I'm grounding myself. Cool, 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 cool. And then with one situation with an accommodation, it just like kind of blew up, you know, a bit. Mm. It was like, Ooh, okay. Like all of this stuff in this past month that I've been kind of like, not suppressing, but a form of suppressing, um, just like got too much all of a sudden. And I was like, whoa, like what's home? You know, like all of the questions, the bigger mm. more existential questions that us as nomads will sometimes ask ourselves, like what's home? You know, like, why isn't this working out? And then a little bit of the guilt and the shame of like, um, should I be feeling this way? Cause like, I'm doing this to myself. Like I could easily find a place, pay monthly rent for like a certain amount of time and blah, blah, blah. But I've decided to choose this reality. So am I allowed to like, you know, feel this? So that was really interesting. So just 
honoring all of those feelings and hearing this from other nomads too, of just like, you know, sometimes it can just get too much when you still think it's okay. So slow nomading is definitely something I am <laughs> bringing into my life for these next couple months. And I have been, but this last month, it just got to be too much. So yeah, that was something that I feel like was really interesting to navigate through. I so hear you <laughs> from recent experiences, <laughs> similar because lots of city moves when I've been used to doing this slow and it completely hit me. But one thing I want to share that I really hear you on and relate on too is like this lifestyle is a privilege, right? We know so many people are seeking to build it. And I think about that all the time, right? And I share very openly since it ties a lot to my business about my experiences and the challenges. And sometimes I have this similar guilt of like, wow, I'm saying this is hard, but like people are aspiring to live this. And it's <laughs> like, and I want to help them live it. But I think it's also, it's like, this is our truth. This is what we're experiencing. And it shows that it's not, and why I share about it too, is it's to show that it's not all the glamour that I feel a lot of people present. It's actually real life and you're doing it on the move, you know? Um, and so I think it's just honoring the emotions you feel or we feel as we're navigating it as all valid, you know? Um, because it's a new way of living that's super unique and it has its challenges. And then giving ourselves what we need to get back to our grounded, um, our grounded happy place uh, when that happens. Yeah, I, I feel the same way also with my entrepreneurial journey. Like I sometimes I'm like, okay, but I chose this. So it's, but it's hard. And I have faces that I'm, you know, that I'm struggling and then just to be self-compassionate, um, even if, You, you are grateful for being able to live that way um, as a nomad or entrepreneur or whatever you chose to do. Um, but it's still, we can still, I think, um, recognize uh, uh, those um, challenges. And then at the same time, um, be uh, so thankful for the opportunities that we have. Yeah. So true. Does anyone else have any Anything they want to add? Jazz has a comment in the chat if you want us to read it out loud. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I don't know. I, like I'm I'm not really living this life. So I feel like I don't have a ton to add to the conversation, but I would love to someday. Um, but yeah, I feel like my biggest challenge is definitely like balancing work and the experience because I'm not slow living I'm usually like there for you know a week or less and I'm like okay like I should get work done but I should also like do all this stuff but I can't just be taking off all the time so it's like this constant like internal turmoil of like what's more important <laughs> yeah Ooh, hear that yeah and that is a that is a, a benefit of the slow living or the slow traveling piece if and I, I hear you have home base too, but if you can go for a longer stretch with your work, just to space that out so you don't, um, so it's not overwhelming too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, add to another idea, because also, I mean, I focus first on the challenges because like that's very alive, but also <laughs> like you guys are talking about, you know, on the opportunity side, like also for jazz, it's like, What I realized the opportunities that lie within there is like, if I go visit, you know, a new country, what I really love to do, which many of us do do is like go to cafes while I'm also working remotely. So I get to like kind of hit two birds with one stone. Like, you know, I get to see the city, the streets on the way over to the cafe. And then if I have some back end work, it's a little harder when you have phone calls, but like on with some back end work, it's just nice to like combine those two things together. So you get to still you know, create your business and do all the things, but also taste the local food and like, you know, go to the local cafes and stuff. So I think that's, that's super, super beautiful. So, so true. Yeah. Okay. So starting, continuing with more on slow travel, we're just, <laughs> we're just, Soaking you all in the slowness today. This is like our some, 
some practical uh, <laughs> tips on how to yes we put together yeah so there's different ways to slow travel and also related to your question jazz this is also like different ways you can take your work and do this slowly over a longer period of time um so there's a lot of different communities now throughout the globe related to like for digital nomads to stay um madeira is a huge one in portugal it's on my list in the future um haven't yet been there uh, but it's supposed to be beautiful it has a lot of community um i lived in um the playa del carmen area during the pandemic for a bit and there was a huge community there um and they're growing as this lifestyle grows and as we all keep seeing new visas coming up um so that's one way to find community and slow travel um also anya's gonna go all talk all about co-living later so we'll get into that <laughs> uh, but also just programs and volunteer options this is growing so much it's insane it blows my mind what new groups are happening like noma collective is one who does um like retreat type digital nomad groups for especially people who are starting out with this and want to give it a try with a more structured approach um but we have here on the side a bunch of different resources um also my the way i like to do it is like getting straight into i like to live separately because i like to have personal space especially like for energy um but i'm really eager to try co-living in the future i've got my eye on your events for when i come back to europe um but when i like to do it alone just to share like there's still ways to enjoy the community aspect living alone you there's a lot of meetups there's a lot of community events it just takes putting yourself out there a bit more um to join the event um and then for me it's dancing salsa dancing has been like a community builder for me in each place because it's a very happy open and welcoming community with dance um but everyone has a unique approach so i'll let you share your wisdom on this too yeah yeah i love that if you have hobbies or you have you know you you know that you find community in different um, places that you can connect to over a certain like purpose for me for example it's it's yoga when i was living in rome um, I have this, I found this yoga studio that I always went to and it made me feel so local because that's what I would also do when I'm in Berlin or in another city that I used to live at or had a base. Um, so, uh, and that of course uh, makes it easier to meet like-minded people that you have something in common with. Um, but also co-living, um, even if you're more introverted or you need a lot of time for yourself, it's not something if it's well done and we get to we get to that like what to look out for in a co-living um and what it takes to facilitate a community in a in a in a good way but um the colleagues that i would recommend um and that we are looking to build is uh looking to integrate um also uh integrate everyone um and especially if you I think every one of us, you know, has times where we uh, need some space. So it's really about looking um, for the requirements and needs of every person who's who's part of the co-living. Um, so I think sometimes the uh, um, yeah the fear is a bit like oh then I have to always be social social and always talk to everyone when I'm in the kitchen. But um, there's also um, yeah, it's, it, it doesn't have to be that way, especially um, if you're staying somewhere for longer. Um, so I definitely would recommend to try. <laughs> and um, co-livings often are actually more in rural areas. We talked about that we don't find as many in the in the big cities, probably because it's not really um, really needed because there's already a lot of opportunity to, to connect. Um, but if you look uh, like off the beaten path um, or really in like hubs of um, digital hubs, let's say, or hubs for nomads, um, you find these uh, co-living opportunities or in general also slow, slow traveling opportunities um, in rural areas uh, come with a lot of um, benefits and opportunities uh, for these areas because we stay somewhere for a long time. So we have, an, we have a chance to 
really make an impact to connect connect with locals it's not just you know bringing economic stimulation but it's also uh going off season uh for um yeah when there's not you know a lot of a lot of tourists for example um i'm talking especially now about about italy where there is a really like intense high season during july and august but if you go there in april and uh, may it's already beautifully warm um and you can discover places which are um which are really really authentic and uh local and really immerse yourself in this local culture um that benefits i i feel it benefits us as travelers because we get a much different we get to know a much different side from this country but it also uh benefits those local regions and communities uh, because we have a different interest um to emerge and to make an impact there i feel like that's a slow travel hack um also is going in off season mm -hmm. when it's not so chaotic and touristy you know especially now that travel is like poof, blown up again um to really like connect um versus like when it's high season you know yeah yeah exactly and then and what we do is also uh, with my co-living retreats we really integrate and connect with local communities that align with our values um so for example i'm at a co-living retreat right now that is going for three weeks um and we have a local initiative here um who is uh trying to make a positive impact they work with refugees for example tomorrow we have a um we have a fest in one of fiesta in one of the smaller towns here uh with refugees uh, on sunday we have a village dinner so these are things and events or happenings that you usually wouldn't get to as renting an airbnb or um you know just uh, traveling through in a fast space uh, a pace it's really just um yeah you need to have kind of bridges uh, and i see a co-living for example as a perfect bridge between um travelers who are passing through um and people who are locally connected but who can also understand the nomadic lifestyle in a way yeah i really love that the immersion and um doing activities like having those already planned to do together so it's like it's like you're doing the activity together you know because sometimes it's activities organized where you go and they're hosting you but it's more it's like a community feel when you're both you know actively participating yeah yeah it's totally different i mean it's nuanced but it's different if you just you know kind of book a tour and you you look at something you take pictures you post them or if you really you know are in contact and build a relationship uh to local people um and i feel well for me it it makes a difference and makes me feel like i'm connecting uh on on just a deeper level um which i, I really like and enjoy completely agree and i feel like it feels so much more meaningful that way and like impactful you know on both sides especially and this is something that it's more challenging at times but to find those gems when you're traveling of um like that local experience one tip i have that has helped with this is the walking tours when you get to a city mm -hmm. if you don't have something organized you meet locals who are hosting them and they'll be like um in mexico once the local was like like oh we're doing this event on sunday like come to my house and so mm -hmm. it was like hosted by him and his family and it just felt so much more authentic than like a via you know i mean I avoid a via tour or any of those big uh, boards now because these are the authentic gems and like what you're including there too. Uh, yeah, we have one question yeah. from from Jess. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, to go ahead. Interrupt, um, just to pick it up about um, language barriers in rural areas. Um, and yes, definitely. Um, uh, so right now I'm in Italy and uh, I can speak Italian more or less. Mina can <laughs> confirm. Yes. Um, and this is really <laughs> good and important um, in, in these world areas. It's true. So speaking, uh, I wish I would speak Spanish, for example. I think that would be so, so useful in traveling. Um, but even 
um, for those local events that we're having here, we have some people who are able to translate. Um, and and for me, I feel uh, sometimes if I go to metropolitan cities, it's yeah, you can feel that people are tired of tourists, or if they hear you, you know, speak with an accent, they immediately switch to speaking English. Um, so I didn't get to practice my Italian as much when I was in Rome, for example. But uh, then if you if you're traveling on the countryside, um, I often have made the experience that people are extra kind of um, um, they make an extra effort to to be understood. Um, but yeah, having some basic knowledge of the language would definitely uh, help. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Such a... Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I was just in agreement. Go ahead. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I like that. I feel like too, um, like taking language classes could be a great way to like meet people or meet other nomads mm -hmm. or transplants, things like that. hundred yeah. percent. Also adding that there's um, like, they're called like tandem language exchanges, like a great organization, which you guys mentioned before, Nomads Giving Back. They, I used to be a part of the organization on the back end, and we would organize events where it would be like a tandem language exchange, like a free event where locals can come, foreigners can come, and they we can either teach each other words in that language or in some way. Um, yeah, I feel like that those are really, really fun. As well. I, I love that. And in um, BA, they have Mundo Lingo. It's in a lot of Latin American countries. I don't know if it's in Europe, but they are language meetups that they have twice a week. Um, and it's similar to what you're saying Nomads Giving Back was planning, uh, where it's locals and it's really like growing and adver being advertised. So uh, it's a great way to meet people. And it's you wear a flag of your home country and language. And so people ah. know what language you speak. Um, and so you can wear multiple flags if you speak multiple languages, and then it allows someone to know like what you're working on and potentially what your native language is. So it's super cool how, um, and it seems like it's grown a lot now, but, um, it's super interesting because after living in Latin America, I gained more and more fluency with Spanish, but going to France for the wedding, I felt like going back to ground zero with like a new language. And it was like. <laughs> a reminder of uh, what it's like and just how language can be such a, I feel that I've gotten so connected with Latin culture from learning it. And I felt very like disconnected in France, which is nothing against France. I just felt like that was a big barrier. Um, and it's just, that's a beauty I was really re reflecting on of learning languages. It's like, we connect in many ways, whether it's like, you know, hand gestures or just like, energy but language is another way um and it can be a challenge for sure i like in france that was hard but google translate by the way if you're in a place where you have no <laughs> minimal language skill um i was using google translate where you can hit play and it will like talk to the person through your app um so that's a a helpful tool yeah um, as we've been talking about this staying connected from anywhere right like when you're working from anywhere we want to be connected whether it's like language or in other ways the key is staying connected and having community and so when you get to a new place there's a lot of ways to do this um it takes effort of course um but putting yourself out there in facebook joining whatsapp groups um there's so many resources now that you can literally search facebook like spain or madrid um expats or madrid nomads and there's likely a group um that you can find travelers and often they include locals in there uh whatsapp groups you tend to have to ask around but just asking when you get to a place like by going to local co-working spots or cafes where travelers and nomads hang out. Um, I think meetup is like a really great resource. I think it depends on the city, but for local events, whether it's entrepreneurship related or like travel related as you're traveling to join and meet people. Um, and I'm a huge, as Mina was talking about earlier, uh, cafes, huge cafe fan and um, 
you can all like meet people in cafes, whether it's locals or other travelers, but co-working is like a place to really often meet a lot of like-minded entrepreneurs too. So there's just so many ways as the world becomes more and more connected and we can work from so many different locations to feel connection as you're traveling. But one overall thing I will say is it does take effort and energy to put yourself out there and stay connected. Um, so tapping into communities like ours for when you don't have the energy to get out there um, for that connection point is super important. Um, but when you do have the energy and you like, it's so beautiful to meet new people in these other areas. So we will move into, so that's staying connected. Um, if anyone has questions on that, um, but staying connected as you travel, feel free to drop it and we can cover it. Um, but a really important factor of traveling is, as a nomad, is accommodations. And I think coming to Europe and nomading here has been eye-opening because um, Latin America is much easier to free flow travel, which is how my travel style has been. And I faced some hiccups and learnings on this Europe journey, which is relying heavily on Airbnb and trusting it. And it, like when I was coming here, canceling my reservation, like the day I was flying to Madrid. So these things can happen. And this is why it's good to know your options and to have backup plans. So I encourage always having a backup plan. Um, and a tip I would say for Europe in general is planning ahead. So really planning ahead accommodations, I think is important because price point is higher, especially with um, higher travel season. Like I've been mind blown by some of Airbnb pricing here in comparison to other countries. So mm -hmm. I think planning ahead for that is super important. Um, also, if you're using Airbnb, planning a longer term stay to get the discount. Because if you book over a month, you often get a discount. And if you don't have that discount, it can be pretty excessive what they're charging with all the fees. Um, and then leaning into other platforms like booking. Um, I'm currently renting out a good friend's apartment while she's traveling to the US. So this was like tapping into your network. Like it worked out so, I'm so grateful because uh, we were able to like work that out together. It's a close friend. So I feel like it's her space feels like a home. Um, and then co-living we're going to get into in detail, but for more budget friendly and one that I've been hearing more and more about is trusted house sitters. So if you love animals, like I'm hearing, it's, it's a really great way to get more affordable option and a fun pet in the package um, or maybe more than one. But I'll let you continue on um, what else, anything else you want to add here? Yes. Um... Yeah, let's let's talk about co-living um, because uh, that's kind of my uh, oh we have a question <laughs> typical first one question <laughs> before um, we go there anyone yeah do we just want to share this openly if someone if yeah, you want to unmute and share share verbally or write in the chat uh, what do you typically book with or what would what is your preferred option let's say. I can't see the chat, by the way, so oh. let me know. <laughs> yeah, For I'm, me, I'm checking. When I was in Dubai at hotels, yeah, that's usually our accommodation, our choice of accommodation, because they have like free breakfast. Yeah, so Ooh, that's, heard... that's a main concern. <laughs> Yeah, I heard it too about like, for example, in Asian countries, um, that it's it's really good to, you know, you can get cheap, really cheap and good hotels. In Europe, mostly it's quite um quite expensive to be honest. But yeah, just saying, sometimes Airbnb houses scare me when I'm traveling alone. Um, she feels like a hostel, hotel, apartment feels better because there are more people around. Yeah. Yeah, Airbnb is like really, I feel, can be very different. Sometimes there's Airbnb who, you know, don't even have, I don't know, the basic, like a, you know, dishwashing tower or something. And then you feel like, okay, well, well you know, <laughs> just um, 
I have like a personal, sometimes a personal thing, but some are really nice. So it really depends. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like really checking those reviews. And I ask a lot mm -hmm. of questions after some recent challenges of really, I had this, I'll just share like very shortly, a super uncomfortable situation when my Airbnb fell through in Madrid. I rented a quick space, like a room in a shared Airbnb and the host was gone, but it was just her son there. And I like just I'd like no greeting or welcome into the space, really. I just like walk in, went to the room um, and then she was not there. And he was like had friends over, which is, of course, it's his house. But like I was just super as a female traveler and comfortable. And um, I tried to I left the space early because there was a lot of like uncomfortable dynamics. And Airbnb like, didn't honor a refund or anything for it when I spoke to them about it. And I just thought mm -hmm. like, so a lot of my opinions on the platform have changed after recent experiences, because I feel that like, that should be something of it's, you know, that's respected if you're a solo female in a space. And that was yeah. not advertised as I arrived, you know, so um, I think it's a growing platform and they have things to work on, which is why I think it's good to know the options and why maybe this is a good segue, why co-living might be a, often a safer option um, because you know a lot more. Well, before we get to that, one last thing is just in terms of when you're choosing options, what's super important is knowing yourself and your needs. If you need personal space and you want your own space versus if you want to share with others. Um, also budget is important. So knowing your budget and planning accordingly, there's different, like we showed the budget friendly options and Airbnb and some others can be on the more expensive side. For Europe, definitely planning in advance. Other places you can plan, like I will say Latin America, I planned some trips really last minute and it worked out perfectly. I don't think I could have done that here, which was my big learning. So I think for yeah. Europe or anywhere high season, plan in advance. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Agree, agree. Especially co-livings or let's say good co-livings, um, they have a reputation. Um, so uh, lots of um, well, lots of nomads or travelers go to a co-living because they know they find a community there, or others have recommended the the space. Um, so that's I think uh, the most common you know way to find them. Um, of course, there are also platforms and um, uh, reviews and, and the common things. But uh, yeah, um, I think uh, that was uh, that's something that's um, um, yeah usually works works really well to just ask around um, and then find these spaces. So they are booked ahead uh, half a year up to a year. So um, if you want to go, if you're in Europe, you want to go to. Tenerife or to the Canary Islands uh, or Portugal in uh, summer, uh, in winter, um, when it's uh, when it's nice temperatures there, then uh, you should definitely uh, be a couple of months early <laughs> for the good yes. things and accommodation I, options. I hear that. I really feel Kolovi needs to be planned in advance too, because there's set dates, you know, often too. Um, and sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll go into this in detail, but different people like are hosting certain at certain events right um but I think just to sum this one up what I have learned this lifestyle has taught me endlessly is understanding yourself and your needs is critical and this lifestyle has taught me beyond what I could have ever managed to know about myself from the challenges and I think that just that has allowed me to choose the environments whether it's the community or the housing that I know is best for me. And so I think really just connecting with yourself and what you want to gain from each experience, um, like whatever you're navigating, because we navigate different seasons of life, like whether it's a more introverted or more extroverted season, using all of that to guide your accommodations so that it's somewhere you feel grounded and secure. Because often entering foreign environments, the most important thing is that you feel secure and grounded and safe. Um, and I'm excited to hear all and talk more about co-living because I feel that's a place you can go where you can find really a lot of values alignment and community to make sure it's a place like you feel really safe and supported. So I'm going to let you share all about it now. 
<laughs> so for those who have never um, heard or tried a co-living, so it's um, an intentional sharing of a home. So it's not just people living together by accident or because they want to share costs, but it's really about um, coming together uh, purposefully um, because we, we believe in uh, sharing spaces. Um, it's about, I think a lot of the, the aspects we've mentioned about slow travel, like finding a community, being amongst others who share your lifestyle, who understand your, your needs and um, the, the good co-livings or the differences we can find in co-livings is uh, with regards to community facilitation. So um, there would typically be uh, someone like a host or the people running the co-living who would take care of um, that the needs of the group and the individual people are met um, that would look out for um, yeah uh, conflicts maybe um, organizing certain activities or events to bring together people to integrate new people into the co-living and overall just to um, create this safe space that we all can feel at home and can feel comfortable uh, so that's that's what it's about and that's what I what I love about the co-living and I've been in other like students houses or shared apartments where it was completely different so just bringing like putting people in the same space does not do the magic yet <laughs> but if um if if it's done well and if it's done right then the, you know then so much can happen and then these human interactions and relationships that we build um, can just uh, gift you so much. And I feel like there's a lot of value. Um, I'm, I always have amazing learning processes about myself or about others when I'm in this community. And like I said earlier, it doesn't have to mean that you have to be like a super social butterfly extroverted person to feel comfortable. It just um, means to pick the right space um, where there's a good community that fits you, where there's a good community facilitation um, so that your needs can, can be met. And maybe sometimes it's not the right thing to do, but um, I definitely recommend to try. Um, and so far my experience uh, has been great. And um, that's why I'm building a co-living <laughs> at the moment in Italy. <laughs> Um, because I really believe in this this lifestyle um, and in this community living concept. So what we love to know is if you have experiences with co-livings um, and and how that was, if you want to share. I actually have an experience with co-living <laughs> because I was in the break, right? Where your idea started. Yes, <laughs> please share. <yeah. laughs> so, I mean, I, I really enjoyed being in a house with other 16 women entrepreneurs for three weeks. It was really exciting. The, the only thing that I found was that I didn't have enough privacy because I was always sharing the apartment, the rooms, etc. And that can become a bit intense <laughs> mm. but uh, I think if uh, if the co-living would be done in just a room for myself or at least for less time uh, sharing a room I would be fine with it but for a month or so I felt it was a bit too much <laughs> yes yeah I hear 100%. that. And I, I think it can be very, um, I also had this intense experience at the break. <laughs> um, and I think it can be very, um, I mean, there was a lot of program also involved and uh, we, we we shared, you know, kind of um, uh, spaces uh, that was maybe set up, but um, like more improvised than you would yeah. find in a co-living where there was, you know, more privacy spaces or you would have mm -hmm. your own room we own bathroom and you know common areas um so but i totally get that um and uh that would not have been something i could have done forever but for yeah, change, yeah, yeah. um it can be a really uh, positive and inspiring experience as well right 
Yeah, I mean, because we are, at least I talk for myself, I work remotely all the time, yeah. right? So I have very little opportunities to meet people in person and especially not so many people at once. I mean, uh, since COVID, mm -hmm. uh, of course, I've participated in conferences and events, but another thing is to live with those people in the same uh, roof for, for a while, right? <laughs> but I thought it was really, really exciting and nice and, you know, just like uh, being around other people, brainstorming ideas in person and so on felt really yeah. good for a change. I think at first was a bit overwhelming for me, but it's not just because of the co-living experience, it's also because we had so many activities on top of that. So there, is, yeah. there isn't really space for, for yourself and to create some sort of routine. Everything has to be very spontaneous in Spain. So, you know, it's also a very particular scenario and I mean eating at 2 p.m and 3 p.m was like whoa <laughs> okay. it's been it's been a while since I've done this you know the restaurants <laughs> open at 2 p.m like in Germany we eat at 12 yeah. right so it's quite, <laughs> yeah, so quite a big uh, shock for sure uh, yeah. although I mean I, I come from from Portugal so it was a little bit reconnecting with uh, with my 10 years self 10 years ago self you know reconnecting a bit with my roots so yeah, it was, it was really nice. And I, I think the co-living experience is uh, really good. I think it's nice to, for example, share lots of spaces if it's just for a short time. So, uh, mm -hmm. but if it's like for a long term, I would be happier with having a bit more personal time and so on. So, but I can see it being a very successful thing for digital nomads, for sure. Thank you so much, uh, Anya and Christine for sharing this amazing presentation and sorry for being so late. But well, well, better late than never, right? <laughs> no, thanks for joining. And and I love uh, one fact that you shared about like really being together in a space um, apart from like an official kind of conference or meetup because sometimes like the best ideas just come when you share coffee together, right? And you don't plan for it. You don't have an agenda or a purpose to meet, but it's like yeah, you're with other totally. entrepreneurs and then you're like, oh, wait, we talked about this or, you know, things come up in conversations. So that's one thing that I that I love. Um, yeah, I think if it could be like deemed topics for one week, like for example, this week we talk about, I don't know, slow travel. Next week we talk about whatever. It would also like maybe even create more of these spontaneous conversations, just having a topic because, you know, when you don't know other people at first, it was also a bit awkward. You know, how do we get to know each other without like uh, almost like a facilitator full time with us, right? So we have to find, you know, uh, our, you know, our ways to live together and create a, a relationship. So, yeah, I mean, I, I see a lot of potential into creating really meaningful relationships in this co-living spaces. And I congratulate you for, for this business that you are opening. Yeah. And what she sh and I love to hear your experience because I haven't yet done it yet, but I feel like I would have felt how you felt of being like overwhelmed by that much time without personal space when you like are really used to your routine in your own space too. But what I think you've shared Anya and that I really love about what you're building is the intentionality you're putting in it, you're putting into it to make sure the connections are made in the way that um, that it's like a shared value, shared connection of how people in who are curated into that group, you know, thrive. Um, I'm curious if they have if you share rooms or have your own space or if there's both options, because I think yeah. like what it helps both. to have like the option, you know, so yeah. if you yeah. thrive with your own space, you know, yeah. We definitely have both options and um, how we start our experiences now is that we 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 have kind of like a kickoff session a community building session where we go go in and we really you know get to know each other um uh, we kind of um what are our expectations we define our values and so you kind of already create this the space for people to start from um and then from there we can the, the connections can be made um, very easy and I already kind of know the story without having to have you know several dinners to understand um, someone better so that really helps to give it kind of like a kick start let's say and then throughout the week we would have several um, like sharing circles community sessions where we always check in and um, do activities together so it's really a curated um, experience um, 
and and I think it's going well so far. I think we have we're having a good vibe <laughs> because I'm here right now at a <laughs> co living experience. So <laughs> it's yeah. I've met so currently many in motion. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, no, I just said it's currently in motion as we're speaking. On yes, this. <laughs> exactly. Very actual. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's amazing. I was just going to say that I met so many fellow breakers that are so aligned also with uh, Nomad Haven and the things that we do here. I mean, uh, Flaminia was bombed with uh, emails from me <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> with, with all of these introductions. But yeah, amazing. I can see that a lot of people that uh, participated in the break would be like, key markets for for you and for the co-living space that you are building and also for online communities because uh, people did have that problem of feeling isolated the majority of them so i mean yeah. maybe flaminia can even join the linkedin group of the breakers and connect uh, with a couple of people from there and i guess you already have that uh, group right anya um guess so but uh if you if you share link i'm checking <laughs> okay i'll i'll share here in the chat because it's an open group nice. anyway. i'll share here nice. um and i think we hit time but i think yeah i love that it we was have to wrap I up appreciated everyone's participation and like i think this is something we can all really relate on many pieces of this of this presentation living um even if we don't live fully nomadically but like taking our work traveling and being entrepreneurs and knowing the balance it requires. And um, I think that what we talked about earlier is so true that it is, and I'm sure all of us are so grateful for the opportunities it provides, but also it has its share of challenges. And one thing of, that I really aim to do is to show both sides of this lifestyle because it is super beautiful and it's been life-changing, but it's also super challenging, but it's expansive because it challenges you in ways that grows you that we couldn't grow just, you know, in our home country, in our hometown. So I think it's just, and it's constantly evolving, which I love um, with this community, with all the different types of, um, with all the different people who are embracing it, with all the different tools that are coming up. I think it's just super cool. So co-living is one in that um, I'm still like aiming to branch into trying out. Uh, so I, I'm excited to stay tuned for future retreats. And I think that it's, I think one thing for co-living I've learned from you and from um, just learning more about it is that it's about, I think it's so important with shared values and shared, um, just feeling like you, you don't know who your people are until you're really in a place, mm -hmm. you know, but feeling that you will connect with people based on shared interests and values. Um, and if you're drawn to it, I would say that's a sign. You probably will. Um, so I think that that's special and I want to experience it at some point. Yeah. Yeah. I think the better you know yourself and what you're looking for and what your values are and what communities you're looking for, um, you're drawn to the right place for you. Um, might it be co-living or might it be something else, but I feel like, um, yeah, communities and, and places, they just uh, find each other. How, how we all found each other here. <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah. I feel like you could create a startup out of this uh, that has an app where you can book co-living spaces and all of that all over Europe, you know? Maybe that's your next step. I already foresee a lot of uh, booking.com vibes, but even much, much better, you know? <laughs> nice. So much more holistic with much... Um, with the slow aspect, you know, like I, absolutely, I it, absolutely, and I will be booking there for sure because that's, <laughs> we need we need more of these options right now. We need we need more <laughs> in this lifestyle, I think. Um, and yeah, this is our uh, just general info um, and a our websites, to, but I know you all know where to find us. Um, but I just loved talking about this with others who can relate and understand. I know we all have unique experiences to share, um, but I think like something to sum up is something I like preaching more and more is just like the value of slowness. I think it's just literally, mm -hmm. I think our society preaches speed, it preaches hustle, and I will continue to preach slowing down and working to embody it as much as possible because I just strongly believe that that is the direction the world should move, needs to move. 
to live more intentionally and to live in a sustainable way that betters our planet. Yeah, slowness, purpose, I'm with you. All right, I need to wrap up, guys. Thank you so much Thanks for, for joining. joining. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Take care. Have a great weekend. Ciao, everyone. Ciao. Bye-bye.